Good evening. Thanks for joining us this evening as we explore the road to Pearl Harbor. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, devastating the Pacific Fleet and killing more than 2,000 soldiers and sailors. On December 8, President Roosevelt delivered his famous infamy speech to American citizens, informing them that the attack occurred despite the fact that the U.S. was in the midst of talks to keep peace with Japan. That same day, with congressional approval, America entered into World War II. We learned these facts in history class, but do we really have an understanding of what led to these fateful events? Was the attack really the surprise everybody thought, or were Japan and the U.S. edging toward war for decades? Tonight we are joined by Dr. Eric Peterson, who will share with us his insights on what led to the culmination of tensions between Japan and the U.S. that brought us into World War II. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peterson. Good evening. Good evening. So many of you. <laughs> I'm really impressed. Thank you all for coming. Um, I noticed in today's paper, and I think many of you did too, the nice front page article on uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. And if you haven't read the uh, Daily News, it's a nice article. I certainly recommend it. Uh, the article deals with the day of the bombing and starts basically with the bombing, uh, which is convenient because that's where I'm going to end with the bombing. Instead, I'm going to take you back about 100 years. My, wa yeah, my wife said, prepare for the groans when, uh, <laughs> when, when they find out and work my way up to uh, that fateful Sunday morning in 1941. Uh, when you study history, and at least when historians study, history, study war, uh, the two questions that always intrigue us the most is how does it start and how does it end? What brought about conflict? And then how was the conflict uh, ended? And what were the consequences then of that conflict to future generations? So this is kind of the beginning. This is how a historian would deal with the issue of how did the war begin? Why did it begin? What were the forces compelling the two nations eventually into armed conflict? On this date, 76 years ago, 360 Japanese warplanes in two waves took off from six Imperial Navy aircraft carriers cruising in the North Pacific 230 miles from Pearl Harbor. Their target was the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. The attack began at 7.55 on a Sunday morning. It lasted less than two hours during which 20 American warships were destroyed or damaged, including eight of the nine uh, battleships that were moored in the harbor. Wrong way. Three hundred aircraft were damaged and destroyed. Two thousand three hundred and thirty-five American Marines, sailors, and soldiers were killed. And 1,143 wounded. In addition, there were 68 civilians who lost their lives and 35 who were wounded. Japanese casualties amounted to 65 killed and one captured. It was the worst single day setback for American arms since the Civil War. In my talk this evening, I will discuss the causes of the attack. I will look back over 100 years to illuminate the economic, racial, military, and imperialistic forces which came together on that Sunday morning. I will attempt to explain what caused an island, Japan, to attack a continent, the United States. <clears throat> 
and why Pearl Harbor, a brilliant tactical victory for the Japanese, led to Japan's catastrophic defeat five years later. Let's begin on July 8, 1853. Ah, wrong way. <laughs> I'll get it. I'll get it. When Commodore Matthew Perry, operating under the orders of President Millard Fillmore, sailed a small naval squadron of four ships into Tokyo Bay, trained his guns on the coastal fortifications, and requested a meeting with Japanese officials. Recognizing that they had very little defense against Perry's modern weapons, modest as they were, the Japanese agreed. The semi-belligerent actions of the Americans toward the Japanese on that day stem from several sources. In the previous decade, the British, as a consequence of the Opium War, had forced China to open up its markets to Western trade, making Japan a convenient way station uh, to the Asian mainland. Simultaneously, the United States annexation of California as a result of its victory in the Mexican War and the ensuing California Gold Rush of 1849 provided West Coast ports and population necessary for an expansion of trade into the Pacific and Asia. Finally, the conversion from sail to steam of both naval and commercial vessels created a need for accessible coal and refueling stations throughout the Pacific Basin. Three years after Perry's appearance, Townsend Harris, the first American consul to Japan, arrived to begin negotiations to open Japan to American and Western trade. And two years later, in 1860, on the eve of the American Civil War, a Japanese delegation traveled to the United States to sign uh, the completed Harris Treaty. Over the next several decades, as the United States became preoccupied with civil war, reconstruction, westward expansion, industrialization, Japan and Asia largely slipped from the American consciousness. On the other hand, in Japan, the opening of the West had profound consequences. Humiliated by its defenselessness against modern West weapons of the West, the old clan-based feudal society, symbolized by the figure of the sword-wielding samurai, broke down and was replaced by a centralized government supported by a modern national army. These changes were aided and abetted by the creation of an industrial economy similar, similar to those that were developing in the United States and Western Europe. And as in the West, greater industrialization led to greater military power. By the turn of the 20th century, Japan had acquired what historian Daniel R. Hedrick has called the tools of empire. In so doing, it became the most powerful country in Asia. Let me offer an aside here. Uh, the historian Daniel Hedrick argues that in the late 19th century, the industrial powers, uh, Britain, Germany, France, the United States, and now Japan, had developed what he calls the tools of empire. That is, the means to conquer and control large areas of the undeveloped world far from their borders. These advantages included accurate, uh, rapid-firing small arms, powerful artillery, steam-driven ocean-going ships and riverboats, rapid communication networks exemplified by the telegraph, and medical advances meant to ward off tropical diseases, especially the discovery that of quinine, which served as a palliative to uh, malaria. Up until this time, uh, Europeans uh, who ventured into the tropics oftentimes uh, lasted only about a year, and then they succumbed to various tropical diseases. 
Likewise, it was now possible to administer uh, areas thousands of miles away because of the rapidity of uh, the uh, telegraph. The uh, armaments, particularly rapid firing uh, rifles uh, and uh, eventually machine guns, completely negated indigenous weapon systems like spears, bows and arrows, and so forth. And it was only after 1850 that all of these uh, new technologies come online. But once they do, uh, it's just relatively quickly before the industrial powers use them to their advantage in what we now call the undeveloped world. <laughs> In an historical, historic, historical anomaly, as Japan rose in power, the imperial government of its vast neighbor China was rapidly decaying. For millennia, China had been the dominant power in Asia and Japan its satellite. By 1900, the reverse was true. Japan was strong and China was weak. Japan's rise to power is easily understood. It was the result of industrialization and its acquisition of the tools of empire. China's weakness is more difficult to explain. Why do empires decline and fall? There are many theories among uh, historians, but little consensus. The only certainty is sooner or later they do. Sometimes empires erode slowly over the centuries, like Rome, like China. Sometimes it's quicker, like the decline of the British Empire in the early 20th century. Sometimes it's almost overnight, like the end of the Soviet Union in 1989. You might pause and wonder what the fate of the United States might be. Which of these patterns might we follow in 100, 200, 300 years? Food for thought. Japan's rise to power at the expense of China is easily traced by examining the pattern of its expansion. Starting with the formal annexation of the Ruku Islands, better known as Okinawa, uh, by the Japanese. China, which had from time to time exercised some authority over Okinawa, protested Japanese actions and even asked former American President Ulysses S. Grant, who was touring Asia at the time, uh, to intercede, but to no avail. In 1879, Okinawa became a part of Japan. In 1894, the China-Japan -Jap rivalry resulted in full-scale war between the two countries. Precipitating, the precipitating issue was which country was to exercise dominant influence over Korea. Modern Japanese military and naval forces quickly won a string of victories over the Chinese, forcing China to sue for peace in March 1895. In the resulting treaty, China relinquished all claims to Korea, thereby enhancing Japanese influence on the peninsula. Additionally, China was forced to cede control of the island of Taiwan, uh, which Japan then named Formosa. China's defeat in 1895 accelerated the decline of the Qing Dynasty, which was finally toppled in 1911. Japan's victory over China in 1895 came as a surprise to many in the West, who had underestimated the extent of Japanese industrialization and rearmament. But the real shock occurred a decade later with the outbreak of fighting between Japan and Russia. Even as Japan was wresting control of Korea from China, the completion of the 5,000-mile Trans-Siberian Railroad by Russia gave that country the means to expand its influence into northern Asia. It was in Manchuria, the northern part of China, that Russian and Japanese ambitions collided. Foreshadowing the attack on Pearl Harbor, the war began on February 8, 1904. 
with the surprise raid by the Japanese Navy on the Russian squadron based at Port Arthur on the tip of the Liaodong Peninsula. Defeating the outclassed Russians, the Japanese lay siege to the port, landed an army, which in a series of battles pushed the Russian army up the peninsula into Manchuria proper. The land battles in this war were big and costly. Russian forces totaled 380,000 soldiers. The Japanese army numbered 270,000. Russian deaths were numbered at around 70,000, while Japan suffered 80,000 dead. Geography, however, favored the Japanese. They were fighting almost in their backyard. The Russians, on the other hand, were forced to cope with supply lines stretching thousands of miles back to St. Petersburg and Moscow. This geographic circumstance, together with the modern weapons used by the Japanese and the ineptness of the Russian high command, tipped the scales in favor of the Japanese. The coup de grace, however, was delivered by the Japanese on the high seas in the Battle of Tsushima on May 27, 1905. With the purpose of lifting the siege of Port Arthur and severing Japanese supply lines, in October 1904, Russia sent the crown jewel of its navy, the Baltic Fleet, on an 18,000-mile voyage around the Cape of Good Hope into Asian waters. The fleet numbered 45 vessels, including 11 battleships. Waiting for them in the narrow waters separating Japan from Korea was the entire Japanese imperial fleet of 80 ships. The ensuing battle on May 27th was no contest. The Russian ships, after 18,000 miles, were badly needed repair. Their bottoms were encrusted and their crews tired and rebellious. They were no match for the Japanese, fighting in their home waters with rested crews and well-maintained ships. 35 Russian ships sank that day. Only 10 were able to escape. Defeated on land and now on sea, the Russians sued for peace. This was the first time that a European power had been defeated in a major conflict by a non-European nation. It served as, it sent shockwaves through Europe and also uh, into the Western Hemisphere. While little remembered by Americans today, the Battle of Tsushima had a number of important consequences that would reverberate throughout the first half of the new century and culminate in the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. First of all, Japan emerged from the fighting as the dominant power in Asia. It solidified its position in Korea, which would annex in 1910. At China's expense, it gradually became the de facto ruler in Manchuria. <clears throat> From the defeated Russians, it received From the defeated Russians, it received the Kuril Islands and the southern half of Sakhalin Island, uh, and an island, thereby serving notice to the Western powers that it now was a player in the great game of empire. Second, after nearly half a century of neglect, the Battle of Tsushima brought Japan crashing back into the American consciousness, especially into the mind of Theodore Roosevelt. Even though it had waged successful war on land and sea, the war had severely taxed the Japanese economy. Hoping to find a sympathetic mediator, the Japanese government asked the American president to convene a peace conference. Roosevelt, who had publicly expressed his admiration of the Japanese military and who wanted to maintain some type of balance of power in Northern Asia between the Russians and the Japanese readily agreed. He chose Portsmouth, New Hampshire as the meeting site 
Besides territorial concessions, the Japanese demanded an indemnity from the Russians to cover the cost of the conflict. The Russians refused. Rus Roosevelt sided with the Russians and finally prevailed on the Japanese delegates to forego their demands. Anti-American riots erupted in several Japanese cities as a result. In reaction in California, anti-Japanese feelings prompted the San Francisco School Board uh, two years later to segregate children of Japanese descent into special schools. The Japanese government objected, forcing Roosevelt to jawbone the school board uh, into backing down. In return, in the so-called Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907, the Japanese government agreed to severely restrict further immigration to the United States. In this activity, the seeds of distrust and enmity were sown between American and, the ja and Japanese relations. A third consequence of the Battle of Tsushima served to validate the ideas of the foremost naval theorist of the time, Alfred Thayer Mahan. In 1890, Mahan, an American naval captain, published a book entitled The Influence of Sea Power on History. Mahan contended that the unchallenged power of the English Navy in the 19th century was responsible for the rise of the British Empire to world domination in the 19th century. Therefore, all countries with ambitions for overseas empire must build their own fleets of powerful battleships. Should conflict ensue between imperial powers, the war would be decided in a single colossal engagement by the combined fleets of the belligerents. As was the case in 1805 at the Battle of Trafalgar, where the British fleet destroyed the, Jap the uh, Spanish French combined fleet and sealed the doom of Napoleon a few years later, and a hundred years later in the Battle of Tsushima. It's difficult to overestimate the effect the book had on the strategists of the time. After reading the book, Roosevelt, in a letter to Mahan, declared it to be very good, admirable, bully, a classic. Across the Atlantic, the Kaiser of Germany ordered it to be read by every serving Navy officer. And in the Pacific, the Japanese Naval Command placed the book in the wardroom of every ship in the fleet. Japan's rise to international stature, the emphasis on naval power and military affairs, and the incipient cultural estrangement between Japanese and American publics led to a growing sense of rivalry between the United States and Japan. At the same time, American feelings toward China were warming. The developing sympathy of Americans toward China in the first half of the 20th century deserves a word of explanation. In 1911, the last of the Chinese imperial dynasties, the Qing dynasty, was overthrown in a revolution. The cause was its inability to effectively govern in the face of aggressive violations of its sovereignty, particularly by, by practically every modern industrial power in the world, including the British, Germans, French, Japanese, Americans, and even the Portuguese, who seized the city of Macau. Over the next two decades, something close to anarchy prevailed, as no one party or leader was able to exercise control over all the regions of the country. I used to have trouble explaining to my students the conditions in China during this period, uh, anarchy. Recently, it's become really easy. I just mentioned Afghanistan, Somalia, and Yemen, failed states. Same happened to China in the first two decades of the 20th century. Ironically, in one context, these troubled times provo proved to be a golden era for Christian evangelism. With the collapse of the old regime, which had served 
as a buttress to traditional Confucian values, a major impetus to Protestant Christian missionary activity was removed. Unlike wide swaths of the world, such as Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, the Indian subcontinent, uh, where religions like Roman Catholicism, Islam, and Hinduism dominated, there was very little about spiritual Confucianism that reminded many uh, Protestants of anything approaching real religion. No choirs, no Bible studies, no Sunday schools, no potluck dinners. China seemed ripe for conversion. Between 1905 and 1925, the number of Protestant missionaries to China increased from 1,300 to 8,000. Despite some high profile conversions, the results were disappointing. However, the effect on American Chinese relations was profound. American Protestant missionaries returning on furlough from the fields of endeavor in China became ready made public relations advocates, spreading the illusion to congregations across the land and particularly in the Midwest that the Chinese and American people had a spiritual bond which could be cemented with just a little bit more money and a few more Bibles. <laughs> Concomitant with the arrival of Protestant missionaries in China was the expansion of Japanese influence in the region. After Japan had achieved regional hegemony along the coast of North Asia, following its war with Russia in 1905, its appetite for further expansion uh, was wedded. A broader context is needed to better understand this imperial hunger. Japan, like its Western counterparts, needed resources and markets to fuel its new industrial economy. Like other developed nations of the, of the, in the late 19th century, again, Britain, France, Germany, the United States, Japan sought overseas colonies and spheres of influence in lesser developed areas. Britain, for instance, the greatest imperium of them all, took direct control of Eastern and Southern Africa and the subcontinent of India. France expanded into Northern Africa and Indochina, now Vietnam. Germany, late to the game, took over patches in Southern and Western Africa. And the United States annexed the independent kingdom of Hawaii, seized Puerto Rico and the Philippines from Spain, and created protectorates throughout the Caribbean. Meanwhile, Japan continued to expand its influence at the expense of chaotic China. The Japanese perspective, then, was it was doing precisely the same thing that other powerful nations of the world were doing and believed needed to do. In the 1930s, Japanese expansion uh, continued at pace. In 1931, Japan detached the northern region of China, from China, of China, from China, and changed its name from Manchuria to Manchukuo, effectively making it a protectorate. Several years later, on July 7th, 1937, Chinese and Japanese troops clashed nine miles outside of Peking at the Marco Polo Bridge. Neither side executed a premeditated attack. Rather, the fighting began haphazardly by regional forces, but it soon escalated into full-scale conflict. For those of you who are Asian-oriented, it's fair to say that World War II did not begin in September 1939 when Germany invaded Poland or two days later when the British and the French declared war on uh, Germany or a year later when Germany invaded Russia or even six months after that when Japan uh, attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, it's fair to say that World War II began on July 7, 1937, when Japan and China went to war. Eventually, Japan allied itself with Germany and Italy, uh, 
China allied itself with the United States and Great Britain. The war between the Japanese and the Chinese was the longest conflict among belligerents in all of World War II. By 1937, the anarchy that had characterized the last several decades in China had abated to such an extent that something like a central government began to appear. The leader of the government was Chiang Kai-shek, an army general and heir to the leadership of the Nationalist Party, which had been created by the great revolutionary Sun Yat-sen. To the surprise of the Japanese, the nationalist government fought aggressively, if unsuccessfully, defended its territory against the Japanese onslaught. Receiving military equipment, including fighter aircraft from the Russians, no doubt payback for their defeat at the hands of the Japanese earlier, the Chinese made Japan, Japan pay dearly for its victories. Nevertheless, by the end of 1937, the Japanese had seized control of most of China, China's great northern cities, including Peking, Shanghai, and Nanking. The seizure of Nanking, which had served as the nationalist capital, was horrific. In several weeks following its capture in December 1937, Japanese troops ran riot. In scenes reminiscent of the sack of cities in the Middle Ages, Japanese troops killed and raped 300,000 Chinese civilians. As the war continued, the Japanese consolidated their control over coastal China, increasingly isolating the Chinese government from the West. But a clear-cut victory over China eluded them. To their dismay, Chiang Kai-shek's government refused to sue for peace. Instead, it retreated up the Yangtze River Valley, eventually establishing its wartime capital at Chongqing, a thousand miles from the coast. By 1940, the Japan, Japan found itself on the horns of a dilemma. While it won every battle, it could not win the war. China was simply too big to conquer. The war was stalemated. As the fighting continued, public opinion and government policy in the United States moved in favor of China. The rape of Nanking, the persecution of American missionaries, and the obvious fact that Japan was a clear-cut aggressor in this war, which, uh, which threatened to upend the balance of power in Asia, tilted America toward China. <coughs> Accelerating this trend was Japan's signing of the tri Tripartite Pact with Germany and Italy in September 1940. I believe the man on the right is the son-in-law of Mussolini, who was the Italian dictator. There's Hitler and the Japanese ambassador. An examination of the events surrounding the formation of the Partite Pact offer a window by which to view the strategic environment at the start of World War II. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. Soon, Mussolini's Italy sided with Germany and declared war on Britain. While sympathetic to the British and the French, strong isolationist sentiment in the United States caused the Roosevelt administration to remain neutral. The Soviet Union, unprepared for war, signed a non-aggression pact with Germany. Japan, already fighting a full-scale war in China, also stayed out of the conflict. A year later, this would be the summer of the fall of 1941, The strategic, the strategic equation had dramatically changed, offering both belligerents and neutral nations new risks and new opportunities. <clears throat> 
The German blitzkrieg had overrun the countries of Western Europe, forced the British to evacuate their army from Dunkirk, and now threatened British and French colonial possessions in the Mediterranean and North Africa. With their mother countries either conquered or defeated, the British, French, and Dutch colonies in Asia were left, were left virtually defenseless. At the same time, the more precarious prospects, at the same time, the more precarious the prospects for Britain and China, the more active the United States came, the, the, <laughs> the United States came in providing aid. The aid took the form of Lend-Lease for Britain, and in the case of China, the application of economic sanctions against Japan. There was no way to supply the Chinese uh, government with adequate amounts of arms uh, because they were literally located a thousand miles inland from the coast and there was no effective lines of communication. The American aid to Britain went uh, were, was arms, uh, food uh, to keep the Brits, British in the war. In the case of American aid to China, it was to apply sanctions on the Japanese to try to force the Japanese uh, to uh, end the war. And as the United States tilted toward the Allies, Japan moved in direction of the Axis. The action-reaction cycle of American-Japanese diplomacy in the 18 months preceding the attack on Pearl Harbor is easily viewed in the sequence of events sparked by the German victories in Europe in 1940. Taking advantage of the defeat of France by Germany, in September 1940, Japan seized control of northern Indochina, what is now northern Vietnam. The U.S. displayed its, its displeasure a few days later by embargoing shipments of scrap iron and steel to Japan. Later still in September, Japan entered into an alliance with Germany and Italy, the tripartite agreement, in which the three countries pledged mutual support for each other should any one of them go to war with the United States. Japan's actions in joining with Germany and Italy in the tripartite pact changed American perceptions of the growing conflict. As mentioned earlier, Japan saw itself acting in exactly the same way as other colonial powers using its superior technological and military power against less developed areas in order to assure itself resources and markets. It saw itself the target of Western hypocritical double standard. The West could engage in imperialistic activity, but Japan could not. But there's a fine line between imperialism and world domination. When Japan allied itself with the Nazis, too many in the West, it had crossed that line. On March 11th, 1941, an act to promote the defense of the United States, otherwise known as Lend-Lease, was signed by President Roosevelt. The Lend-Lease Act allowed the President to provide any vital material to any nation he deemed worthy of American support. It gave Roosevelt literally a blank check. The three recipients eventually receiving the most uh, Lend-Lease aid was Britain, the Soviet Union, and Chiang Kai-shek's government in China. On July 24th, 1941, Japanese troops invaded southern Indochina, southern Vietnam. Two days later, the United States froze Japanese assets making the purchase of American oil impossible. Another aside for a moment, historian Eileen Crediter has called World War II the war of the internal combustion engine. It was the first major land air war fought by machines, planes, tanks, trucks, which of course ran on oil, on gas. Therefore, control of an adequate oil supply was absolutely essential. 
Unfortunately for them, the three Axis countries, Germany, Japan, and Italy, had no domestic supplies at all. They were dependent upon external sources. Italy from wells in Libya, Germany from sources in the Balkans, and Japan mostly from the United States. Therefore, an interruption of oil shipments from abroad would spell military disaster. Japanese storage capacity in 1941 amounted to about six months of normal oil usage, less during time of war. The American condition for resuming shipments was that Japan leave Indochina, end the war with China, and uh, its occupation of the mainland. Therefore, Japan either had to abandon what it had achieved after four years of bitter fighting in China, or find new sources of oil. By the way, by 1941, the Japanese had suffered about 185,000 casualties in the four years of fighting with the Chinese. No Japanese government could advocate a retreat from China without facing a military revolt. The only recourse then was to find new oil and to do so quickly. The closest developed oil fields in the region were those of the, Dutch East in, uh, were those of the Royal Dutch Shell Company on the islands of Java and Sumatra in the East Indies, which at that time was a colony of the Netherlands. Holland, the year before, had been invaded by Germany, occupied, and was able to uh, provide no defense of its Asian colony. With the imposition of the oil embargo, time and geography became determining factors. Japan had six months to replace American oil, or its people and armies would literally run out of gas. It was in the words of the historian Herbert Feist, crazed by the tick of the clock. Cra crazed by the tick of the clock. Time dictated where to strike. The undefended oil fields in the East Indies were the only location where oil could be quickly obtained. Geography dictated where else to strike. The oil supply lines from the Indies ran back to, J back to Japan, ran a gauntlet between the British base in Singapore and American naval and air bases, Clark Field and Subic Bay on the island of Luzon in the Philippines. To guarantee the protection of its supply lines, then, Singapore, Java, Sumatra, Java, the Philippines, the home islands. Any oil from these regions would go like this, back to the home islands. Here's Singapore. Uh, there is uh, the American bases on the Philippines. In order to guarantee then uh, and secure its supply lines, it would literally have to take over uh, Singapore and the Philippines. Any attack on the Philippines and Singapore, of course, would lead to war with Great Britain and the United States. In J Japanese thinking, Britain, which in the fall of 1941 was still fully engaged against the Germans and the Italians, could offer only slight resistance. The United States was a different matter. It was a measure of Japanese desperation that had now planned a war against a country occupying a continent endowed with limitless natural resources and with the population double that of Japan. So what were the Japanese thinking? How did they expect to win? What was their strategy for victory? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the answers to these questions seem to be based on a combination of factors, including the balance of military power as it existed in 1941, 
Japanese naval strategy dating back to the Battle of Tsushima and to prevailing racial nationalism of the time. By 1941, the war was going well for the Axis. Japan's ally Germany, which had invaded the Soviet Union the previous June, seemed to be on the verge of victory over the, German, over the Russians. In six months of fighting, German forces had killed or captured an unimaginable seven million Russian soldiers. How can that happen? In addition, German and Italian forces were advancing down the Balkan Peninsula, had handed the British Army severe defeats in the Mediterranean and North Africa, and were now poised to capture the Suez Canal. It appeared that the war in Europe would be over very quickly. With this, within this context, then, Japanese strategy evolved. It planned a four-prong attack against the Indies, Java and Sumatra, Singapore, the American bases in the Philippines, and, of course, Pearl Harbor. The objective was to capture areas rich in natural resources, especially oil, protect supply lines back home to the home islands, and destroy the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. If all went according to plan, it would assure itself the resources to finally bring China to its knees and delay the American counterattack until such a time that the balance of world power had tipped strongly in favor of the Axis. Would not then the soft, decadent, racially impure American government, bereft of allies, accept its diminished place in the world? It worked for a while. The attack on Pearl Harbor was successful, surprising the Americans and mauling their fleet. The South Asian colonies were overthrown and the defenders were scattered. Four days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Adolf Hitler, and probably the only promise he ever kept, uh, made good to his promise and declared war on the United States. But by then, but then it all went wrong. The Soviet Union did not collapse. The British did not sue for peace, and the American people proved to be less soft and decadent than the Japanese supposed. In fact, Pearl Harbor steeled their resolve to continue to fight to a successful, to a successful con conclusion. In retrospect, for the Japanese, Pearl Harbor was a tactical victory, but a strategic disaster. Thank you. <clears throat> I believe we have some time for questions, if there are any, or comments. Yeah? I enjoyed it very much. I just wish you could keep on going till the end of the war. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. too soon. <laughs> well, maybe another time. <laughs> yeah? There, Bob? Um, there were conspiracy theories regarding yeah. the FDR and what was known before the attack. Um, what were the, what would you say were the impulses for those conspiracy allegations? The, uh, the question is, what caused uh, some scholars uh, and some people to believe that the attack on Pearl Harbor was a conspiracy of the Roosevelt administration to drag the United States into war against Germany? This is sometimes known as the back door to war theory, that Roosevelt really wanted to go to war against Germany in order to uh, support the British, but that the isolationist sentiment in the United States was still very strong. And as a result, he uh, manipulated the Japanese into attacking Pearl Harbor, hoping the Germans would then declare war, which they did, which would then allow him to uh, go to war against Germany. Uh, the foundation of that uh, theory was the fact that the United States had broken uh, the Japanese naval codes. So we did understand that war was imminent. Um, but 
two factors uh, uh, play in here. One was that uh, in 1941, uh, the United States was not on a wartime footing. Uh, there were just a very limited number of uh, clerks in the uh, State Department, War Department, that were deciphering uh, coded Japanese telegrams. Uh, there just weren't enough to keep up. The volume of traffic was so great and going in so many different directions as the Chinese prepared for their multi-pronged invasion, that it was difficult to just simply keep track of it. Uh, secondly, today we're used to hair trigger responses, uh, alerts. Uh, then uh, there, was, there was nothing like this. Uh, just a decade earlier, uh, who was it, Secretary of State Cordell Hall, I believe said when he was asked about American intelligence, gentlemen don't read other gentlemen's mail. It just wasn't necessary. I believe George Marshall, that Sunday morning, the chief of staff of the American Army, was horseback riding. Nobody was on a wartime footing. And I think it's as simple as that. There is no serious contention today that there was any validity to, to, to that particular charge. Now, the historians have looked at it time and time again, and they just simply could not come up with convincing evidence uh, that it was anything other than just kind of inertia. Back. No, no. See, this is, this is, again, this suggests the desperation that the Japanese had. They started a war that they couldn't end. You know, I, I used to tell my students, so the Japanese land an army in San Francisco and Los Angeles, a um, couple hundred thousand men, which would have been impossible. They didn't have the transports to do that. But let's suppose they did. Then what do they have to do? Well, they get on their horses and on their tanks and on their trucks and they drive up to Reno <laughs> and then they got across the Nevada and Utah desert and make it to uh, uh, Salt Lake City and then from Salt Lake City they have you know drop off some troops occupied and then on to Omaha and from Omaha probably Chicago then they better send some troops up to Minneapolis and some down to St. Louis and then on to Detroit Pittsburgh Philly Boston the United States, or the, the uh, New York, there wouldn't be anybody left. In other words, it was just ridiculous. They had no chance and they knew it. Also, the majority of their uh, army was still involved in China. So there was no, no credible threat to the American mainland, other than maybe an occasional lobbying of a, a submarine shell into the uh, coast. Well, I could say rumors were Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, he was allowed to return to Japan, okay. as were American diplomats in Japan allowed to return to the United States, as were American diplomats in Germany allowed after a few months to return to the United States. People still kind of played by international rules. Uh, you're talking about oil and stuff. Uh, you really don't hear that much about oil in the Philippines. No. In that area, is there that much uh, there now? Yeah. Um, the, uh, not as much as it used to be, but yeah, there is still uh, Royal Dutch Shell, Shell Oil, uh, uh, own these oil fields. The, what is it? Uh, where are we? Right here. Uh, is this Bruni? Okay, it's a little sultanate, isn't it? Yeah. And the Sultan of Bruni is supposed to be the richest man in the world because he lives on oil. And it's a little tiny country sitting on a huge, still a huge pool of oil. So yes, there is still a lot of oil there. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why didn't the United States think that might happen then? Well, can I be a little bit cynical here? 
Uh, I would love it if policymakers, whether they're waging war uh, <clears throat> in uh, Iraq, in Vietnam, maybe potentially in Korea, would at least have a college history course on the history of those regions. <laughs> uh, oftentimes, uh, policymakers are dreadfully ignorant of the culture, the geography of, uh, of faraway lands. Uh, if I remember correctly, there wasn't a single high-level Kennedy advisor during the, the Vietnam War who had any, any, con any uh, experience in Asia. They just didn't. Uh, and certainly, if you were to move up to the invasion of Iraq, how many of Bush advisors knew the difference between Sunni and Shia Muslims? I bet you none of them. So there is a profound ignorance there, I think. Uh, also, it was a long time ago, and it was simply not part of the American consciousness. That's not to say we didn't understand, knew they did it. There was, if there was going to be attack, the Americans assumed it would be on the Philippines, which it was. Uh, uh, and we were, in the, we were in the process of sending uh, B-17 bombers to the Philippines uh, when the war broke out. Uh, but we did not think that uh, they would be able to attack Pearl Harbor. Also, naval air warfare, big carriers, were brand new. The Second World War was to introduce aircraft carriers. Uh, to the fleet. And so no one really had experience with what these things could do. So it was, it was a combination, I think, of that fact, of all of those factors that led us simply not to take seriously uh, the notion that the Japanese might attack Pearl Harbor, that they could do it. It was, a, it was, a, it was a, uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, tactical accomplishment that they carried it out uh, way, way back. Uh, they were not particularly worried because none of these countries, um, well, let's see. The Americans were probably the most sensitive to this because we consider ourselves to be not only an Atlantic nation but a Pacific one. The British, the French, the Germans, you know, they dabbled in, in Asia, uh, but their primary focus was the Middle East, the subcontinent, and Africa. And so I think the, um, their consciousness, their, their, their um, concentration was uh, far less on, on, on Asia. The British did take over Hong Kong, of course. Uh, the Germans dabbled in China for a while before the First World War. Uh, but again, this, was, this pretty much was second fiddle to uh, their much more aggressive activities closer to home. Yeah? I think one of the problems was our ethnocentrism. I was in Taiwan for a year and a half in the 60s. And at the American Embassy, which had a really good size staff, they didn't have a single person that could read, write, or speak Chinese. Yeah, yeah. The whole embassy, not a one. Mm -hmm. Not a single person. The first generation of American diplomats that dealt with China, this would be men, men right. in, their, uh, uh, in the 1930s, uh, many of them were the children of all those Protestant missionaries. They were born in China, uh, they were raised by Chinese nannies, they were absolutely fluent in the various Chinese uh, dialects. Uh, uh, and they were active until the 1950s when they began simply to go, you know, to retire. Some of them were purged during the McCarthy hearings. Uh, and one of the standard sort of responses of what went wrong in Vietnam is that we didn't have any Asian experts left. We had a lot of experts in, in Europe on, you know, who spoke fluent Russian, French, German. But we didn't have that same level of expertise, diplomatic expertise in Asia, following, the, again, the retirement of these, uh, that first generation of Asian experts. Way back, yeah. I enjoyed your history, but as you were saying, the silence of World War One, 
Japan did declare war on Germany in World War I, primarily so they could take over a German uh, uh, enclave on the coast of China. But otherwise, they played no significant role in World War I. And they were perturbed then when, in 1918, at the, at the Paris Peace Conference, they were not accorded greater uh, territorial concessions. Uh, but otherwise, they just marched in to um, uh, see the peninsula that jets out toward Korea on the Chinese coast. The, the um, uh, Germans had an enclave there. Uh, they taught the Chinese, by the way, how to make beer. That was kind of their major contribution to uh, a Chinese culture. But they, they played terrible. very little role. And they made terrible beer. Terrible, yeah. <laughs> terrible beer. Yeah. Could you make a comment about moving the U.S. fleet from San Diego to... Say again? Could you make a comment about moving the U.S. fleet from San Diego to Pearl Harbor? No. I, I don't know anything about it. Uh, when, when did that take place? Okay. Okay, I did not know that. So uh, I, I, I have to plead ignorance. Uh, over here, yeah. Mm. And I think if that influenced the Japanese to become more imperialistic, even if they had a quote, uh, good yeah, a, a patron in Roosevelt. Yeah. We had, I think, I think we had mixed emotions. Say, between 1910 and 1920, uh, there was a lot of anti-Japanese, anti-Asian uh, feeling on the West Coast. Uh, the Chinese, interestingly, were the first people in 1882 to be uh, prevented from immigrating to the United States. The Chinese Exclusion Act of, 18, of, 19, of 1882 literally prevented any further Chinese immigration. Uh, that was in direct response to uh, anti-Asian influence on the West Coast. Uh, the, Jap the Gentleman's Agreement of 1907 uh, did pretty much the same thing for the Japanese, pretty much excluded them. Uh, so there was, a, there was this very strong anti-Asian current on the West Coast. Um, it dissipated as it moved east. Uh, but on the West Coast, there was a lot of this sort of, uh, of, of uh, sentiment. Roosevelt himself was impressed by the Japanese, uh, particularly their defeat of the Russians. This was just, he, would, he said it was just remarkable. Right, and, and some, people, some people think that since Roosevelt, you know, I don't think the Japanese needed to be convinced of that. Well, I, I right. think. But they had this, you know, pat on the back from another yeah. official that had He certainly didn't do much to uh, uh, place uh, impediments in their way. Right. Uh, and, uh, and again, except he, um, he did not want the, Jap the Russians to have to pay indemnities uh, because um, he wanted to maintain some sort of balance of power in Asia. Uh, I think what Roosevelt wanted was to see no one country dominate Asia. And this uh, later, of course, became American policy uh, that we need to balance China and Japan. And we need to prevent, if we can, or discourage either one of them from becoming too powerful. And in the, in the 20s and 30s, the problem was Japan. Today, it's the other way around. By the way, we are back to uh, uh, today uh, to the age-old um, uh, balance of power in Asia. That is, China is strong, Japan is far less strong. And so what we've done today is return to the norm after this anomaly of about 100 years when the Japanese dominated. And maybe one of our problems with dealing with the Chinese today is that we're not used to it. <laughs>
that we have to learn to accept the fact that uh, we're back essentially in history where China is very strong. We have to learn to live with that. And I think we are probably having to some degrees problems with it. Um, I've gone on for over an hour, so I'll hang around, but I don't want to keep those of you who uh, want to go home and watch a football game or whatever to uh, uh, feel at all deprived. So thank you very much. I think we're done.